Hi, I'm Wendy Perkins, and this is my week two reflection uh, regarding the, week, the readings <clears throat> for this past week. Um, there were several things that struck me about it, and uh, I'll detail that. And I think that units one, two, and three are a, uh, have a good tie-in and connection um, to uh, the readings in, uh, uh, in one child, two languages. Um, so to begin with, what some of the things that um, struck me about uh, the readings in One Child, Two Languages was um, uh, tied in a little bit to what was previously discussed in last week's readings was the Omega children. And um, the Omega children um, are essentially, you know, socially ignored. Um, they have poor communication skills, which would be indicative of a child who is just learning a new language. Um, you know, they're, them being ignored by the students leads them to diminished opportunities to actually enter into social situations and practice um, these skills. So children who are English language learners often find themselves in, in that, being treated in that exact same way, and there were um, a couple case studies uh, or case observations in there um, that demonstrated uh, that kind of social iso isolated fact. Um, so when they're getting started to learn, another thing that struck me when they're getting started to learn English, they, they may use their home language um, to begin with. And once they discover that that kind of is not working, then they will just essentially stop speaking and go through kind of a nonverbal period. And I thought this was an interesting um, and is a, a good thing for any teacher who is having a child uh, new to the language in their classroom, understanding that um, they may not necessarily be shy. It may not be a cultural thing that they're not speaking. It may, literally, it may truly just be a language uh, differential. So... Um, at that time, they, the child doesn't use their home or their or the new language they're trying to learn for this, uh, all intents and purposes here, English. Um, and one of the studies that was discussed was the two-and-a-half-year-old uh, little Japanese boy, Takahiro. Um, and he was both nonverbal and socially isolated. And what it happens is, is that this kind of, that kind of illustrates how... Um, the social impact of learning to speak a new language is that when while you're going through that nonverbal period, you are all that you're also very socially isolated, or the children are very socially isolated. Um, so, and that kind of ties into a little bit of the in units one, two, and three, um, the self-affirming activities that they uh, describe and give a guideline for implementing within the classroom, um, self-affirming like the I am poem and book, um, or in unit two, recognizing human qualities in yourself and others, um, and then moving on to self-identity and developing self-identity. And I think um, a home, the child's home language is part of their self-identity. Um, and an important part of it, um, not just, it, self-identity but culturally speaking um, and so it should always be uh, demonstrated to the child that the teacher and, and those around value that child's home language um, and that and while they are learning to speak English they're not um, they don't feel that their home language is is being disregarded um, so anyway so on to Another thing that struck me was um, as they develop their nonverbal communication, uh, or once they go nonverbal, then they develop, they kind of develop a nonverbal communication. Think of this combination of uh, facial expressions, hand signals, gestures um, to accomplish them getting, um, um, getting particular, uh, getting attention, um, getting someone to hand them something, uh, and other things. Um, but the social consequences of nonverbal communication are that the English-speaking children then kind of either treat the, the non-English-speaking children like infants, as in babies who are incapable of doing things for themselves, or they're ignored as they're invisible. Um, that, that was notated on page 46. Um, and the English-speaking children modified their behavior around these other children, uh, around the non-English-speaking children, to 
either, you know, treat them like a baby or to, and with exaggerated gestures, or to ignore them completely as if they don't exist. Um, so nonverbal essentially to them equals a non, so not social member of the group. Um, and they even, there was one uh, demonstration of this, even going so far as to not acknowledging the child's um, childless peer, an English language learning child peer, presence on the pictures of the class uh, that the teacher had taken pictures of the class that he was in and they named all the children, named all the other children, but completely, while you could plainly see Pierre, did not acknowledge who, that his existence in there because he was a nonverbal uh, English language learner. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, so also what struck me is that about part of the process of learning English involves um, rehearsing or echoing English speakers. speakers um, so that goes through the phases of you know spectating, which would be watching um, how other people, what other people say, other children say, and in what situations, and then echoing, they rehearse it, uh, and then repetition, um, often to themselves in private speech, as noted on page fifty. Uh, during the nonverbal period, they begin to decode patterns in English, um, and they then will try to um, use some of the speech and phrases that they've heard in other situations um, where they think it will fit. Um, the younger, the, this I thought very interesting, the younger the child, the more native-like the pronunciation. In other words, they have less of an accent as they learn English than the older child learning English. Um, so as I was mentioning, uh, English language learning children, they engage in data gathering about the new language and then um, they begin to play with the new language and then they uh, engage in telegraphic and formulaic speech. Uh, telegraphic speech, the uh, content, you know, the contents of the, like the subject matter is content words are used in the whole, are, are make up the whole utterance. There's not adjectives um, or adverbs involved in it. Um, that's usually good for naming af objects and actions. And as they develop vocabulary, um, they use it to interact with uh, English speakers. And then in formulaic speech, um, the children, you, they copy, that's when they copy previously uh, stuff they've heard and where they kind of play around with it. So if they found a particular phrase or sentence that worked in one situation, they will then apply it to other situations where they feel, uh, where they feel there's similar context. Um, this is really valuable for them to enter play situations and to get uh, English language learning children, in English speaking children's uh, attention. Um, and then they move on to productive speech um, and they com combining the purpose phrases. Um, I think that, uh, Again, the self-affirming activities are going to pl play a big role in having English language uh, learning children become part of the social fabric within the community of the classroom and that that inclusion um, supports them in learning their new language. Uh, and finally, um, just as a clear understanding, um, their CALPs, their conversational language, is what will come first and um, has to be at a certain point before um, that the uh, VIX or the academic language um, can be introduced um, to them. One of the ways that um, this can be addressed is um, including English language um, uh, implicit and implicit English language instruction during uh, content instruction um, and I lost my train of thought okay so that was my reflection on um, this week's readings and sorry it went a little long we're almost at 10 minutes but I uh, hope you enjoyed it um, and thank you